She held her daughter tightly in a desperate attempt to coax her despair. Feelings a child her age shouldn't have felt and all she could do was cry. Her mother's strong words of encouragement was the only thing that kept her together. The resentment built within her like wildfire and she didn't understand why. This is the unfortunate story of a little girl throughout a major part of her school life. She didn't start always like this. She was once a little passionate girl that started talking, walking by the age of nine months, crazy about life. She believed that life was her maze, waiting for her to explore it. She actually believed that if she ran fast enough, one day she could fly. She lived in a perfect bubble. A bubble where she's going to live in a world that people will judge each other by their actions and their actions alone. And if you want to get ahead in this world, your actions are the only things that can take you there. That little girl was me. And that perfect bubble was the bubble I once lived in. You see, this bubble unfortunately burst when I was in fourth grade. When I was a new girl in school, and I thought everything was going to be as perfect as it was in kindergarten and the first years of my life in school, where I always wanted to stand out and wear the flashiest outfits. I always wanted to memorize my sister's poetry and homework when she got back home. I thought it was going to be the same way. To my despair, everything I thought was right turned to be wrong. Everything I learned that the world was going to treat me in turned out to be not true. It was the first day of school, and all my classmates could point out were my thick braids and dark skin. All they could see was a little girl with hair as they coated glued together and burnt skin. I got a lot of questions about my braids and skin. How do you glue your hair together was a very frequent one. I styled my glued hair. And why my skin was so dark, that was something extremely interesting that was brought to my attention. I wasn't aware of color till I was in fourth grade. I remember the first day my homeroom teacher came into class and told us that we needed to go back home and tell our parents that she's Canadian and as she quote, white Canadian from the mountains. I took that message innocently and went and told my mom at home. From then, color was a thing. People will look at you and the first thing they'll see is color. This continued for a long time till the lowest point I got to was that one of my classmates came to me and told me that I needed to change my name into anything else. She saw me unworthy of having her same name, and as she quote, because I was black. I wasn't upset with my classmate. She didn't know better. I wouldn't call her a bully. She honestly didn't know better. I ran back home and I was in a fury how am I going to change my name? What am I going to change my name into? I wanted to fit in. I didn't care if I had to change my name. I was a little girl. I can still remember my mom's frown, how upset she was. She told me to go back to school and tell her that I wasn't changing my name into anything. And if she didn't like it, she could change hers. To me, that was a hurrah moment. I did something. But something in me broke. I had a tag, I had a title, I had something my classmates knew me about. I was the short, dark, ugly girl with thick braids. And I embraced that label naively. I remember my mom used to take us to a swimming pool every weekend. And I found swimming to be my way of letting out my anger. 
I'd scream under the water. I'd swim so fast till my bones started hurting. I found a way to let go of the pain. But there were so many questions in me. Why was I being pointed out single-handedly just for looking different? I found the answer. It wasn't that hard. To me, it was Sudan's fault that I looked the way I looked. To me, it was Sudan's fault I had the dark skin. To me, it was Sudan's fault I had the thick braids. To me, it was Sudan's fault I looked the way I looked. I spoke the way I spoke. Therefore, Sudan is the reason I wasn't accepted in my class. The resentment towards my country began to build within me like wildfire. And all I wanted to do was be anything but Sudanese. The braids soon were gone. I did not want my mom to braid my hair to school. I wanted in a bun or anything like the other girls. I was the one black girl in a class filled with blondes, fair-skinned girls with rosy cheeks. I never got the rosy cheeks. But I managed the hair. But the resentment continued to build. Till I went back home, back to Sudan, my mom decided, her parents actually decided, that it was time for us to go and actually see what Sudan is about. I remember nothing more, or nothing more pleasurable, than sitting with my grandmother at evening time. She was an illiterate woman, but her wisdom was greater than anyone else's I knew. She'd gather us around, and by the end of every chat we'd have with her, she'd tell us a specific phrase. It was in her native tongue. It meant those who do not truly love and benefit their family and country will never truly love and benefit themselves. I took that phrase naively as a child, but it was at the back of my head. I went back now to school, and I was ready. I was ready, and I was going to deal with what the girls were doing to me in school. I lived by a phrase called, get the getters before you get gotten. Meaning, if anyone approached me, I point out each and every flaw in her before she could get to my what I thought was a flaw. I was a very good bully. I protected myself by hurting everyone around me, and I was in a continuous state of paranoia. This continued till I was once in eighth grade. And I knew very well not to indulge myself in anything that related me to the country that was the reason people saw this facade and couldn't see beyond it. It was the national day of the country I was staying in, and my school decided that it would be better for every student from a specific country to celebrate their country in their own way. I knew by now that I did not want anything to do with Sudan. I'm going to sit aside and let whomever wants to do, do whatever. By now, there were other Sudanese girls in my class, but we were still the minority. There was one girl who decided that she could join a group of Egyptian girls, and it was time for them to rehearse their program, and she sang with them their national anthem. Suddenly, the Egyptian girl halted every other girl that was singing and demanded to know what my classmate was doing, why she thought she could sing with them their anthem. In her words, she said that the girl did not love her country or respect her country the same way she did, therefore she saw her unworthy of singing her anthem. All of this was unraveling in front of me, and I was shocked. I was jealous, because this girl loved her country so much 
that the idea of another person disrespecting it meant a lot to her. I was jealous because I did not feel the same way about my country. I was not proud the same way the, same, the other girl was proud. I was simply embarrassed to be Sudanese. But at that moment, I promised myself one thing. I was going to find a way to fall in love with my country. I needed that. I need to be confident enough to speak in my Sudanese dialect to my other friends. I needed to be confident enough to wear my braids the same way I wore them in kindergarten. I needed that. We went back to Sudan that same year, and this time, I had a target, I had a goal. I was going to fall in love with my country. I needed to bond with my country. I joined a local gym, and once again, I did not fit in, because I was only 13. And going to the gym at 13 years old isn't something you'd like to do. The coach at the gym realized that this wasn't my place and asked me what I actually loved to do. I explained to her my passion of swimming. The idea of defying gravity in single space to me was magic. The way the water buoys you and you feel free, to me, that was the best feeling in the world. She told me I was in luck and that there was going to be a swimming contest. I didn't hear anything else. Everything she said after that to me didn't mean anything. I was going to be part of a swimming contest, full stop. The time of the swimming contest came, and I entered an arena filled with people that were screaming and had hair glued together and had skin burnt, and they all loved to swim. I was in paradise. No one came towards me and asked me how I glued my hair in the morning. No one came towards me and asked me how did I get my skin so burnt. They all wanted to talk about one thing and it was swimming. And instantly, I fit in without asking to fit in and I could stand out fitting in. I made friends instantly and people were welcoming me for no reason. It was the time of the race, and we all aligned. You see, the thing is, I actually wasn't supposed to be part of this contest because this contest was for, for professionals. It was ready, get set, go. And in 50 meters backstroke style, we jumped into the water like knives. And after the longest race of my life, I was yanked out of the water. By whom specifically, I honestly cannot remember. But I remember one person screaming and telling me, I won! She told me, Sarah, you won first place backstroke. I wasn't asking to win. I never in meant to win. I just wanted to have fun. That was the moment I fell head over heels for my country. Insane for my country. My country allowed me to fit in, and no one cared how I looked. And to add to that, the cherry on the top was, I won. Standing in the crowd of the contest that day was a great woman, a queen, I'd like to call her. Her name was Miss, Med Miss Sarah Jadullah. And to those of you who do not know Ms. Sada Jadallah, she is a hero. She is the first African woman to swim across the Nile. And to add to that, she has poliomyelitis. Now, for those of you who do not know what poliomyelitis is, simply, she has really weak limbs. And she, outstandingly, swam across the Nile. Now, I met this great lady that day, but I was too young to understand what was happening, too crazy. There was so much adrenaline. 
I honestly can't remember it that well. But I knew one thing for certain. I knew now the feeling that my Egyptian friend once had, and it was like a fire inside of me. I wanted the bond with my country to evolve. I wanted it to grow. I wanted to be more and more jealous. So I go back to school, prouder than ever, neglecting the half a lesson my school gave us about Sudan, and that's all, and this is what they told us about Sudan. They told us that Sudan was in North Africa, surrounded by several countries, you will learn about later, and it is called Sudan because the people that live in it are Sud. That was half a lesson and we went on to talk about Morocco. We gave them a week. My country deserves more than a week to be spoken about, and that, after I fell in love with my country, I understood. After that, the braids came back. The dark skin, I was proud of it. The Sudanese dialect, you wanted to talk to me, you have to understand it. My hunger for falling in love with my country and loving my country more and more every day was the greatest feeling I've ever felt. To be proud of where you are, to be proud of who you are, to love your country because it gives you a name tag, it lets you fit in and stand out at the same time to me, was because of my country and I am forever grateful. The phrase my illiterate grandmother once told me finally came to me. Irkatina kherkakum mini kherkakum was the short phrase that I used for so long but didn't know that it answered all the questions I thought were unanswerable. The resentment that built within me was gone. I stand in front of you today, urging you, whomever does not love their country, for whatever reason, find that spark within you, ignite your passion, and let it be the first step you take towards building an everlasting bond with your country. Your country deserves that much. Sudan deserves this much. And I'd like to leave you once again with a phrase from the wisest woman I know, Thank you very much.